Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the basics of temperature calibration. We have um, a bunch of panelists who are really excited to talk to you about temperature calibration. But a few quick items before we start. We are going to have a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation today. So if you have a question you would like our panel to answer, you can submit that in the question box on the control panel. You'll see that on the right side of your screen there under the web GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we are recording this webinar, so including the Q&A session, the recording will be sent to everyone within about 24 hours after the webinar today. So without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Jen Hardy to introduce our panelists and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for joining. I'm Jennifer Hardy, the Calibration Product Manager here at Massey. I've been here for about seven and a half years in different roles, but all revolving around customer service and calibrations. So for our panelists, I'm gonna have them each introduce themselves. So we'll start off with Jeremy Kraft. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm Jeremy Kraft. I'm a metrologist and the supervisor of methods and systems. Been here a couple of years. Uh, I deal with database integration and uh, some of the policies and procedures and a bunch of different things. <laughs> so on to John. Hi, thank you, Jeremy. I'm John Mastiello, executive vice president, co-founder. Uh, been with the company for over 35 years involved in metrology of course calibration and um, all other areas of the business that is that are, is a lot of fun and lisa hi i'm lisa shah i've been with mossy for over 17 years now um i'm a senior metrologist and on to matt thank you lisa my name is matt thompson i am the director of metrology here at mossy i've been here for about a year and i've got a close to 20 years experience in the biopharm industry. And Rob, Bob. Hi, I'm Robert Perry, Senior Metrologist, Metrology Laboratory Manager, been with Massey for over 20 years. And now off to Jen with key takeaways. Sure, so thank you again for joining us today. Um, for nearly 40 years, customers have trusted Massey for uh, top quality SI traceable calibrations and we're excited to be with you today to share our knowledge. So here's some key takeaways that you can expect from today. Uh, first, what is calibration? Why calibrate? Understanding uncertainty and traceability as well as the basic principles and methods of temperature calibration, avoiding common pitfalls and the importance of accredited calibration. So just to help us get to know our audience, uh, Amy's going to do a quick poll. So Amy. Thanks, Jen. We do have a quick poll here for our audience members and the poll is just gonna show up on your screen if you could just take a second to answer that. The question is what industry best categorizes your company? Um, I'm gonna give a second for that to, for you guys to answer. And we'll share the results. Calibration affects so many different industries. It's just kind of nice to get an idea of where our audience is at. Let's give a couple more seconds. Looks like most people have answered. All right, so we'll close that. And the results are 77% of of you are in the biopharma industry, 8% in a commercial lab and 15% checked off other. So like you said, calibration is definitely a part of many industries. So thank you for answering the poll. And I will hand things back to John, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about what calibration is. All right, thanks, Amy. So what's calibration? <clears throat> Basically, it's a comparison of measurements uh, between two instruments one measurement from the test equipment for unknown accuracy, which is usually commonly called the unit on the test, uh, to a measurement uh, from the test equipment of unknown accuracy. So, excuse me, of a known accuracy, which is a standard. Sorry about that. With the comparison data, you now can minimize the variations in the accuracy of the unit on the test by adjusting or compensating for the error. 
All right, um, <clears throat> thank you. So now, Jeremy, can you give everyone a closer look at the different types of standards? We'll do, Amy. So, or Jen, I'm sorry. So uh, we're going to be talking about traceability and standards. So uh, every metric SI unit has its root in a physical constant. Uh, the SI units are maintained by a national metrology institute, things like NIST or the NRC. Uh, from there, uh, primary standards from a commercial lab are compared to uh, an SI unit at the NMI, or again, uh, National Metrology Institute. Uh, the commercial lab's working standards are compared to a primary standard. Uh, the customer's process instrumentation is then compared to the working standard. And this is what forms the unbroken chain of comparisons called traceability. So when you hear about NIST traceable or traceable to the SI units, this is what that means. Uh, so a great example might be a thermocouple. Uh, the thermocouple is calibrated at a commercial lab. We would, we would compare that to a PRT. Uh, the PRT would then be compared to a fixed point, and then the fixed points are then uh, calibrated by NIST or another national lab. Yeah, and on to the next slide. Thanks, Jeremy. Actually, next up we have a quick trivia. This is just a fun trivia question for our audience. Where on earth was the coldest temperature ever recorded? And um, I'm just going to give another second or two for, for the audience to answer what you think. Where do you think the coldest temperature ever recorded was? We have a couple more seconds. Looks like most people have answered. Interesting response. Um, majority of people thought Antarctica, I mean, Siberia. Next up was Antarctica, 39%. 11% of people thought it was Germany and 6% guessed Mount Washington. So thanks for answering the trivia question and to share with us more about the answer. Um, Jeremy's gonna talk a little bit about coldness. Yeah, so actually 11% uh, of you are right. It actually is in Germany, and um, coincidentally, it's, it's actually the coldest place in the universe. And uh, basically, scientists were able to uh, freeze a substance down to 38 picocalvin by dropping it down a tower and slowing its motions with magnets. So up until a couple of months ago, the, the record low was actually in Cambridge, Massachusetts at MIT. Uh, and they, they use uh, lasers to slow down the motion of the, of the molecules, so. All right, thanks, Jeremy, that, for that fun fact. Um, Lisa will help everyone understand temperature metrology. Lisa? So temperature metrology is basically the comparison of a thermometer to a known temperature. A temperature scale is a way to measure temperature relative to a starting point. The Fahrenheit and Celsius scales are both examples of relative temperature scales where the measurements are more or less than a reference amount. The Fahrenheit scale is really only used for everyday applications in the US. Virtually the rest of the world measures temperature in Celsius. The Celsius scale is based off of the physical properties of water. Zero degrees is the freezing point of water and the other reference point 100 degrees C is the boiling point of water. On the Fahrenheit scale, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, with 180 degrees between the two reference points. The Celsius scale is the most common scale used in scientific applications. As thermodynamics developed, it was necessary to define temperature scales at absolute zero, where all molecular motion ceases. The Kelvin scale sets the null point at zero K, and uses the same increment or degree size as a Celsius scale. Zero degree C is equal to 273.15 Kelvin. The Kelvin is also this, uh, the SI unit for temperature. Water plays an important role in defining temperature scales. This brings us to the triple point of water. The triple point of water is the point at which water exists in equilibrium at all three phases, solid, liquid, and vapor. We have a video showing the realization of our mini triple point cell. 
The cell is super cooled in this uh, maintenance bath under controlled conditions. And when it's removed, uh, we give it a little shake and you can see the ice mantle forming around the thermometer. So when water is in this state, we know the exact temperature to be 0 0.01 degrees C or 273.16 Kelvin. This is the starting point of all ITS-90 calibrations and is included in all temperature calculation of resistance thermometry. The ITS-90 references all temperature measurements to triple point of water resistance ratio values. ITS-90 fixed points are based off of phase changes of pure metals, freezing points, melting points, or triple points. MASI has other fixed points to define the ITS-90 scale. Um, <clears throat> this graph here shows MASI's accredited fixed point range. We offer calibrations from the triple point of argon, which is minus 189.344 degrees C, all the way up to 660 degrees C, which is the freezing point of aluminum. Between these two points, we also have a triple point of mercury cell at minus 38.83 for 4 degrees C, a melting point of gallium, which is 29.764 uh, degrees C, freezing point of indium, which is approximately 157 degrees C, <coughs> freezing point of tin at 231.928 degrees C, and a freezing point of zinc cell at 419.527 degrees C. Uh, this chart is, will be available with the webinar recording. It's a little bit hard to see. So, all right. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so, when asked about calibration, the first thing we typically hear is compliance. So, let's talk about why we should calibrate uh, accuracy. So, if accuracy is necessary, you need to calibrate. So, if someone's asking about the temperature outside, that does not require accuracy. It's either warm, hot, or cold, etc. <clears throat> but in the pharma world, with some vaccines, if the temperature goes below zero degrees C, then the vaccine becomes, <clears throat> excuse me, ineffective. So calibrations in part allow the consumer to take medications with the assurance that they are safe and effective. <clears throat> Required, <clears throat> excuse me, for um, medicine, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm gonna turn it over to you, John. <laughs> John, you're on mute, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, one of the reasons for uh, calibrations, uh, why we calibrate, uh, one component is, is interchangeably of components within within a process, right? If you've got two components that are calibrated, you can exchange them. If you have one that's calibrated, might be and one that's not calibrated, you have, don't have confidence that that one's gonna work. The other is uh, calibration is, is an important uh, factor for scalability. However, it's not common for R&D organizations as they tend to allocate their funds for other purposes. A, process, a, a product in development example with a sensitivity to temperature could have a devastating effect on the effectiveness when the batch size increases from 500 mils to 20,000 liters. Okay. So now when growing um, a metal size cells in an incubator, 27 degrees C, uh, excuse me, 37 degrees C, which is optimal, whereas a lower temperature is less efficient, okay, and a higher temperature would cause the enzymes a denaturation and abruptly halt the process. Consider the value and the loss of the limited master cells or working cells. These are critical components. It takes sometimes millions, billions of dollars to get to these master cells, so you don't want to lose any of them. Okay. So now, as far as um, uh, safety issues, okay. Autoclaves are large steam pressure vessels with uh, lots of energy. Uh, correct calibration would provide a safe environment, all right, uh, when opening the door. Imagining opening a four foot by four foot door with one PSI inaccuracy in the reading to the positive side. That's the equivalent of about 2,300 pounds of hot steam pressure pushing a heavy steel door towards you. Yeah. So you really want to make sure that's correct. On the other side, if it was just a little bit in a vacuum, you're never gonna get the door. So, you know, you gotta call maintenance. So, not a safety issue, but it's a product, productivity issue. So, so. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, 
Thank you, John. Now I'd like to turn it over to Jeremy. He's going to clear up some confusion about some key concepts. Yep, thanks, Jen. So we're going to talk about uh, accuracy and precision. Um, the reason being is uh, they're really two uh, confusing terms. People mix these up all the time. Um, they're not the same thing. So we've got a set of bullseyes um, on the slide here. So if you look at the one on the left, uh, there's a set of dots in there, and those represent a measurement, uh, almost like darts on a dartboard. But uh, the dots are scattered, but the average value is close to the center. So uh, we could say this is not repeatable, it's not precise, but it is accurate because the average value is close to the center. Uh, then if you look at the second bullseye, this is something that is not accurate and is not precise. Again, we have that scatter with the dots, again, the measurements, but they're, they're not close to the center, they're not near the average. And then on the third bullet, we have a close grouping of those dots, so it is precise. Uh, but it's not accurate because it's still not close to the center. And then finally, uh, we have a device that's both accurate and precise. We've got the close grouping and it's close to that average value that we're looking for. So uh, a good example of this might be, I know an unstable temperature bath. You might have a bath that is fluctuating up and down, but the average value might be you know, close to nominal. So if you're trying to use this device, you know, put a thermometer in there, you might catch that peak or trough and you might not get a great measurement. So what you really want is a device that exhibits both properties. And for the next slide, we're going to talk about measurement uncertainty. So first off, what is uncertainty? Uh, in layman's terms, it's just the error in the measurement. Uh, that's really all it is. Uh, and a big takeaway from this is all measurements have some uncertainty on them. Even if you were to have your device calibrated by NIST or the NRC or, or UCAS in, in Europe, um, they would still provide at least some uncertainty with the measurement. Um, measurement poses some risk to the customer. Um, Massey avoids measurement risk by selecting a standard that's more uh, accurate than the device being tested. Um, in addition, uh, we've recently adopted the new ISO 17025 2017 requirements, which follow a risk-based approach to calibration. So we take we use the measurement uncertainty to uh, adjust and optimize the the, uh, uh, the device. So we provide a measurement uh, that is closer to nominal and outside of that uh, measurement risk area. All right, that's good info to keep in mind. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, we've covered a lot of ground, so let's talk about what tools we use to get the measurements. So Matt, can you tell us what's out there? Thank you very much, Jen. Good afternoon, everybody. I get the coolest slide out of this whole deck. Animals on there. What could be better than that? Uh, whatever you do, folks, please do not use any temperature devices to play the drums. Um, as much as we want your business, we don't want it in that way. Uh, so let's talk about some temperature measurement, measurement instruments. Uh, first and foremost, and the one that people uh, are pretty used to are liquid and glass thermometers. Now, these used to be a household item for a very long time. Not so much anymore, but uh, liquid and glass thermometers are very linear. Uh, they use liquid expansion to indicate temperature. Typically, spirit-filled, um, you may still be able to find some mercury-filled uh, liquid and glass thermometers as well. However, due to the Massachusetts Mercury Management Act that was enacted in sometime around 2006, it does prohibit the sale and import of mercury instruments into the state. So unfortunately, uh, mercury-filled liquid and glass thermometers are hard to come by these days. Uh, some out there instruments, uh, thermocouples are a great instrument to use. Um, it's an electrical device that uses two dissimilar electrical conductors and they form an electrical junction. Um, it produces a temperature dependent voltage as a result of the Seebeck effect and the voltage can be interpreted to measure temperature. These things are super inexpensive, very easy to use and depending on which one you get can be very robust for the application that you need them for. The next set of uh, instruments that we have are, are really all resistance based. Um, SPRTs, which are standard platinum resistance thermometers, PRTs, which are platinum resistance thermometers, and RTDs, which are resistance temperature detectors. Now, these three items are all, again, 
resistance based. Uh, they're all super linear, and as your temperature goes up, so does your resistance. Thermistors are also resistance based. However, they're very nonlinear. Um, the resistance actually decreases as your temperature goes up, and you typically need some other device to actually interpret the readings of the thermistor, something that's been paired with it. And finally, resistance bridges. Uh, these measure resistance ratios with extremely high accuracy. Uh, these are also otherwise known as super thermometers. Um, they can measure temperature. They can also measure uh, voltages and, and such as well, resistance, of course, as well. Um, we're super excited here at Mossy. As you'll see on your screen, we have an Adatel 286 resistance bridge, aka super thermometer. And uh, we are about to be proud owners of one of these so we can actually test it out and see how great this product actually is. So thank you very much, everybody. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, so now we're ready to calibrate. So Bob, can you give us an overview of calibration methods? Absolutely, there are several different calibration methods. Direct comparison of RTD, PRT, thermistor, or TSC, TC to a standard. Or uh, the next one is a loop calibration, which is calibration of a thermistor device attached to a meter in comparison to a standard. Then we have device calibration, which is, again, direct comparison of the thermistor device to a standard or separate calibration of a meter. And then we have system calibrations, with calibrations of a thermistor device as found typically in loop with the meter, then direct comparison of the thermistor device to a standard meter calibration, and then an as left with the loop again of the thermistor device connected to the meter. Direct comparison allows the end user to plug the device into any system and users must remember that error is the combination of the temperature device and the meter. If the meter is uncalibrated, the error will be unknown. Loop calibration typically reduces the error of both devices. Downside is one device goes, the, other, the whole system needs to be sent in for calibration. Device calibration is like comparison, but includes a meter separate calibration and uses must remember that the error again is combination of the devices. And then the system calibration allows the end user to have an as file loop, to separate device calibration, as left loop calibration. This will result in lower errors. And if a device fails, if you have calibrated multiple uh, temperature devices, that's the only thing that's out of service. The system can still be used. Now on to Amy with another poll question. Great, thanks, Bob. We do have another poll question for, for you guys. We've just reviewed the four calibration methods with Bob, and we'd love to hear more from you about your processes. So this poll is just, what type of calibration do you typically have on your temperature standards? Either um, direct comparison calibration, loop calibration, device calibration, system calibration, or if you're not sure, or you're just here to learn more about what this is all about, um, not sure is an option as well. I'll just give you a minute to answer that. And just while you're answering, um, just a quick reminder, if you do have any questions you wanna ask our audience at the end of the webinar, um, you can post those questions anytime in the question box on your control panel. We're asking you all these questions in polls, we might as well ask us some questions too. All right, two more seconds to answer. I'm gonna check out these results. And it looks like um, the winner is comparison calibration at 25%, but a good sprinkling of the other types of calibration as well. 13% showed loop calibration, 19% used device calibration, 13% system calibration, and 31% um, not sure. So thank you for answering that. And we're gonna move on and John's gonna talk to us a little bit more about commonly used equipment for temperature calibration. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. There's several uh, com different components uh, required for thermal calibration process. There's, as uh, they discussed earlier, the, the standard reference thermometer, then there's the thermal transfer process, and the unit on the test. Illust illustrated, uh, the illustration displays a fluke dry well calibrator, which is being utilized to calibrate a handheld meter, which ultimately could be used as a reference thermometer. 
in that case also there's a you, you could have an additional PRT connected to that device that would have an internal meter that would be a, a SPRT a, a meter a standard meter then you have the stirred, stirred, stirred liquid baths, and they're commonly used for calibrating sensors within a range of, say, minus 80 degrees C using alcohol, all the way up to 420 degrees C with a salt solution. And then the uh, other alternatives are dry block and furnace calibrators, which cover from either minus 90 degrees C all the way up to 2300 degrees C. Great, so we have another quick poll. So Amy, back to you. Thanks, Jen. Our next question is, of all your applications, what is your tightest temperature tolerance? And let me bring the poll up here. If you just take a second to answer this, it'll be an interesting um, Give a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm going to close this. The results are in. 40% of you said the tightest temperature tolerance is less than 0.01. 47% at 0.1, 7% said one, and 7% also said greater than one. So thank you for answering that. I'm gonna turn this back over to Jeremy to talk about some common pitfalls in temperature measurement. Sounds good and thank you, Amy. So common pitfalls, this is a great topic. So there are several sources of error when it comes to temperature measurement, um, things like uniformity error, which is could be axial or radial, uh, axial being the vertical, radial being um, kind of like horizontal, I guess. Uh, there's stability, stem conduction, um, and quite a few others. Uh, but these sources of error can be applied to almost any temperature measurement that is made. Um, and for the next examples, I'm gonna use a, a dry block, kind of like what John was just uh, illustrating in his uh, diagram. So all devices have thermal gradients. Again, this is an axial uh, error. Um, if you're using a dry block as your temperature source, um, you'll want to make sure your, your standard and your device under test are inserted completely so they're at equal height. The other thing too, air is an excellent insulator. If you're using a PRT that's a different diameter than the hole it's being put into, you know, you might get some error from that. Uh, you want to make sure you have a, a, a tight fit in the right, in, uh, right insert. Um, if you can't find something that has the uh, right diameter insert, you might want to look at a, a liquid bath. Um, also, too, uh, most thermometers have a minimum insertion depth. Um, if you can't insert the thermometer all the way, uh, you'll probably have what's called uh, stem conduction, where some of the uh, heat actually bleeds out of the stem and into the outside air. So if you can apply this stuff to, you know, uh, like a temperature measurement in an oven. So uh, if you're going to calibrate that oven and you're placing your PRT in a different spot than where your product normally sits, you might get some of that uh, uniformity error. You want to make sure that your, your um, standard is placed in the same spot as where your product is. Um, and lastly, another great way to minimize error is just to check for drift. Uh, you know, check your probes against something like an ice point, a triple point, or a more accurate uh, PRT. Uh, everything has its own natural drift. Uh, at some point, it might go out of tolerance. It might be a year from now or 10 years from now. Or, uh, you know, if you're using that thermometer against a drum, it might go out now. <laughs> um, so Massey performs periodic check is, checks against all its primary standards, and we uh, use control charting to track that. Uh, we're able to detect trends and mitigate out of tolerance results from our from our standards. All right. So importance of an accredited calibration uh, lab. So uh, first off, we're going to talk about you know what is an accredited lab. Uh, basically, an accredited lab has been audited and has had their measurement process and quality process uh, scrutinized. 
uh, to become an accredited lab, the lab must demonstrate in front of an auditor uh, that they're using the proper procedures, uh, they can perform the measurement, and they can calculate the associated uncertainty for every parameter on their scope. Um, <clears throat> an accredited lab must also prove the validity of measurement results. Uh, we have asked to use a proficiency test to, to prove all the results are within the stated uncertainty. Uh, all measurements must follow that unbroken chain of comparisons back to a National Metrology Institute. That was that uh, pyramid we were showing earlier. Um, and we must have a respectable uh, measurement uncertainty. Um, so an accredited lab does not have to follow any of this scrutiny um, and they may provide you with an unknown uh, level of quality. So uh, here at uh, Massey, we use NAVLAP. Uh, NAVLAP is an internationally recognized accrediting body. Uh, they are very much known for their metrology leaders. Most of them come right from NIST, and they are also known for having very stringent audits. So uh, out of the three major accrediting bodies, they're, they're typically known for having the, the toughest audits. So with that, we also offer three different certificate levels, um, levels one, two, and three. Uh, the level one certificate is an accredited calibration. Uh, this provides an uncertainty and an acceptance limit. Uh, the acceptance limit uh, helps us mitigate uh, measurement uncertainty from the measurement results that we provide to you. Uh, level two calibration is also an accredited calibration. Um, it still provides the results from the device under test and standard, but uh, the biggest difference is it doesn't show you a pass or fail um, and it doesn't show a tolerance. So these are good for, you know, folks who want to me uh, interpret their own measurement results. Maybe the standard you're using, it has an incredibly tight tolerance and maybe your process tolerance is only 10 degrees. So if that thing is off by, you know, just a fraction of a degree and you don't want to write a uh, big long kappa or uh, perform all that paperwork, you can use this uh, certificate level to interpret all your results each time. And the third level is our tried and true uh, calibration uh, uh, certificate uh, traceable to the International System of Units. Most people are familiar with uh, NIST traceable and that's what this is. So the biggest difference is this one does not show the measurement uncertainty. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our certificate levels, we did um, recently present another webinar on this topic, so you can find that on our YouTube channel. So Amy, I think we have one more poll before we wrap up. We do, and thank you, Jeremy and Jen and all of our panelists. We are gonna go into our Q&A session after this poll. So if you haven't had a chance to send in a question and you would like to, we have a few questions, but we'd like to have all the questions that we can get from you guys. This is your chance, just type it in the question box. So for our next poll, it's actually more of a survey. We just wanted to get a few thoughts from you, the audience about uh, topics you might like to see from us for another webinar. Um, so there's a couple topics here that we have, um, ideas for future webinars if you just give us a quick maybe one or two that you would be interested or all of them or none of them just let us know where your interest is because we want to make sure that these webinars and talks that we do um, are relevant to you and are what you want to hear so thank you again I'll give a couple minutes a couple seconds for answers for this <clears throat> give our give our panelists a minute to catch their breath before we talk about all your questions. Okay, I'm going to close this poll. Thank you for your answers. Um, and we are going to go into our question and answer session now. It's never too late to send us a question. Even while we're talking about somebody else's question, feel free to type in um, a follow-up or a separate question of your own. So. All right, to start, I'm going to read the first question. What does out of tolerance mean? John, I don't know, maybe you could give an answer to this one. Sure, I'll take that one. Out of tolerance. Well, out, out of tolerance can uh, can be as uh, as minimal as um, it's just, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't impact anything, because if it is a device that has no um, 
impact to operations or to production or product or what have you. It could be like the thermostat in your room. You know, you're just going to be a little cold or a little warm. However, if it happens to be on a self-culture incubator that I mentioned, and it was out of tolerance, then you know that's why your cells are burning or not growing. So that's uh, so the out of tolerance. So it can be impactful for cost. Um, it could be you know shut you down. It could be a recall. So it's uh, usually in the, our industry, the farmer industry, the biotech industry. It's not an individual that determines. You know, an individual determines that it's out of tolerance, and then it creates uh, uh, it creates havoc where now they have to go through departments and groups to determine how how that impacts everybody. So it it can be a, a big deal. Okay, thanks, John. The next question is, what does it mean to optimize or nominalize an instrument? And does Masi perform this? I can take that. Okay. So um, to nominalize, so first off, just because something's nominalized doesn't mean that it's been out of tolerance. There's, there's a number of reasons we would nominalize or optimize something. So for example, the, um, the unit is close to the tolerance limit. You know, everything has its own natural drift rate. You know, things will eventually drift out of tolerance. It's just, you know, when, that, when that's going to happen. So by uh, optimizing something or nominalizing something, you know, back to the, the, where the standard is, um, you can help mitigate uh, the chance that that thing might go out of tolerance again over the next Cal cycle. <clears throat> um, the other thing it does for you, um, and there we have another webinar on this, by the way, but if you're right at the tolerance limit um, of, of, of whatever you're checking, there's a 50% probability that it could be falsely in or out of tolerance. <clears throat> so by nominalizing that, we help mitigate the effect from measurement uncertainty. So if you want some more information on that, there's another webinar that we have, and uh, we could send somebody the link if uh, anybody's interested. Yes, definitely. Um... We will send everyone a follow-up email with, with links to our YouTube channel and our additional webinars. Lots of good info. Um, the next question I have from the audience is, um, all right, is recording as found data necessary? John? I like that one. Uh, it, it, uh, again, it, it depends. If um, if the, the example of measuring the thermometer in your room um, as found as left, it doesn't make any difference. It is critical when you have a process, a, a critical process, and you decide to record the values as it was out of tolerance, intolerance, or whatever the error was. If it happens to be out of tolerance, that's very critical information because that's the information you need to determine from the OOT and how did they imp how it's impactful? Okay, so that's why you need to do that. Great. Okay, thank you. Next question: What is the significance of repeatability? Lisa, do you want to answer this one, maybe? Uh, sure. Uh, repeatability is significant because it shows the consistency of a unit or device. Um, well, it, it describes the ability to provide the same result over and over again. It's also an important component in, um, in estimating the uncertainty of a measurement. Um, Jeremy alluded to that on his bullseye um, slides, showing repeatability um, as important. So that's the significance of it. Great, thanks. Okay. Um, what determines calibration frequency and how do I know at what interval I should calibrate? Who hasn't answered one yet? Matt, you take this one? I take that, Amy. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, calibration frequency is based on a number of factors. Uh, primarily, you know, criticality of the instrument, you know, in what it's measuring, uh, the historical performance of the device, and even process run times can all be factors into the frequency of your calibration. Now, you know, these intervals uh, in general, it's all about risk, right? It's risk to the company, it's risk to the product, and it's risk to the patient. So it really is up to the engineers, the metrologists, the, your QA department 
to work together to figure out what the best calibration frequency is for the instruments that you're using. Awesome, great answer. Okay, um, I have I have one last question and one last call for questions from the audience. If you have any other questions, send them in now. Um, so for our last question, recommendations for avoiding pass view calibration. Bob, can you give us an answer for this maybe? Yes, um, there are several ways to avoid pass calibrations. Have a database that will maintain your calibrations and your intervals and automatically give you reminders. Pay attention to the calibration labels that are on the devices. We'll also give you a visual reminder. Or you can hire a company like Mossy who will send out periodic reminders. Great, good answers, okay. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you to our panelists. Um, just another quick reminder, we will send you a recording of the webinar and some relevant information and, and handouts as well, probably within, within about 24 hours. So thank you for coming. We hope you enjoyed our presentation today and learned some things. Always feel free to reach out to us at mossy.com or to any of our panelists directly um, for further questions or, or sales if you're interested in receiving a quote from us. We appreciate you coming out today. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.